Okay, there we go. And it looks like we have some more people who have hopped on in the meantime. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So my name is Lamari, and I am the Senior Director of Community Engagement at the Decentralized Identity Foundation. So I'm the person you'll come to if you're really confused when you come in the door at DIFF, you don't know where to go. I'm a great person to lead you to where you'll probably want to be. Um, and I also do hold new member orientations and various events, uh, especially educational events, such as the one we're having today. So today we are joined by Marcus Sabadello, who is the co-founder, the founder of Danube Tech in Vienna. And he's going to be sharing about decentralized identifiers and also any questions you have about did resolution, the universal registrar, uh, any anything that's come up related to DIDs, Marcus is one of the foremost experts in the world on decentralized identifiers. Um, so feel free to ask as many questions as you like. There's no bad questions. When you ask questions, it also is going to help Marcus get a feel for where people are at and where people might want to dive a little deeper. Um, so with that, I am going to hand it over to Marcus, who will share a little bit of an overview, and then we'll go into questions. So I'll hand it over to you, Marcus. Thank you very much. I will, I will share my screen. Okay, hope that's uh, hope that's working. And yes, it's uh, working. We can see it. Um, okay, so uh, yeah, thanks for the introduction, Lamari, and uh, of course, welcome everybody. I, I hope you're having a nice uh, Diff Hackathon so far. And uh, I'm here for one hour now to basically talk a little bit about. It's uh, teacher resolution, universal resolver, universal registrar. Um, I mean, I, I have a, a few slides on on these different topics, but uh, we're not such a big group, so we can also happy, of course, to make this very interactive. So if you if you already uh, have some concrete questions, or if you've uh, experimented maybe with these tools, or if you're using Deeds already, then uh, can also use the time, of course, to talk about things that uh, that people are are interested in. I guess uh, you could just at at any time ask a question in the chat or raise your hand. All of that is fine. Um, so very happy when when there are some questions. Otherwise, I'll I'll just go through a few slides. Uh, basically, start with its uh, introduction to its themselves and then talk a bit about its resolution and uh, these tools, Universal Resolver, Universal Registrar. Um, maybe before that, just a quick mention also of one of the DIFF working groups. Uh, the DIFF Identifier and Discovery Working Group is uh, one of the working groups at DIFF and it's one of the original working groups at DIFF that uh, has already existed when when DIFF was founded. I'm, I'm one of the co-chairs of this working group. Uh, there's a GitHub repository with information about the working group. There's a list of, uh, of work items. So there's some very interesting items that uh, people work on, both specifications and some open source code, uh, some of which we'll, we'll talk about today. And the group meets uh, on a bi-weekly basis. And uh, basically we discuss everything or anything that's related to, to identifiers, right? So we think that that identifiers are the basis for a lot of other things, right? We, we always need names or addresses in, in the digital world when we, we want to exchange uh, verifiable credentials, when we want to change messages, when we want to establish some connections or relationships for for pretty much any kind of interaction we always need identifiers uh, like deeds or other types of identifiers and then in this group we we can discuss uh, any topics related to to uh, identifiers so, so sometimes we talk about 
dates are different. Uh, date methods. Well, about two weeks ago, we had a really interesting presentation from the uh, Chinese Academy of uh, Information and Communication Technologies about uh, an infrastructure that they are building. So just advertising a little bit our group here. And uh, then, then yeah, I would I would start just uh, with doing an introduction about DITS. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not sure how many people know. I, I suspect if you're participating in, in this hackathon, then probably a lot of you already have an idea of what of what deeds are. Uh, so I probably shouldn't waste too much time on the on the basics, but uh, just to just as a as a reminder, of course, deeds are a type of identifier that has been standardized at the World Wide Web Consortium. It's a type of URI uh, that starts with did colon, and then there's something called the did the did method, right, which uh, which tells us how exactly a did can be created and used and and resolved and and managed. So there's there's not really one way how deeds work. There's not one uh, one single uh, client server protocol, for example, that uh, that's used for for working with deeds. Right? It's it's not like DNS. Uh, it's not like DNS where you have one protocol basically and one global infrastructure for managing and identify a namespace but with with deeds there is this concept of a deed method which creates an abstraction layer on on top of many different types of of deeds and and then there is the method specific identifier which depends on this deed method and and uh, there can be many different types of deed methods many different ways how how deeds work but uh, yeah, what's what's important, of course, is these are meant to be decentralized, right? So not managed by a central authority and uh, persistent, cryptographically verifiable and resolvable identifiers. We'll, we'll talk about that a bit more, of course, what it means to uh, for deeds, uh, for identifiers to be resolvable. And the other thing that's also important is that deeds always have a built-in notion of of control right so a deed is uh, typically created using cryptography or using uh, asymmetric key pairs and uh, so somebody who creates the deeds uh, typically has a private key uh, which is then used for controlling the the deed so that's that's built into the deed concept Unlike uh, UUIDs, for example, right? If you have uh, UUIDs, uh, that's another type of identifier that's also decentralized. But by by looking at a UUID, there's no way to uh, to est to establish who controls that identifier. So yeah, maybe th th these are the most important things, right? That is, did methods that these are resolvable and they are controlled by by someone using. Uh, using private keys. Uh, here's just, just some some examples of of did methods. Probably a lot of these are, or some of these are probably familiar to you. And you can see a sort of and, and there's a there's a registry document right and at the World Wide Web Consortium at the did working group where the, the did specification was was written. There's also a list of known well-known uh, did methods and I, I think it's almost 200 and and so this did method again this tells us how exactly and, and where the did is created and and managed and how it can be resolved and a lot of the did methods use technologies like blockchains right or distributed ledgers if you look at did indie which is based on the hyperledger indie uh, technology epsi is uh, european blockchain service infrastructure, so a, a European blockchain, did Ether based on Ethereum, did BTCO based on Bitcoin, did ION based on Bitcoin plus an extra second layer of uh, of storage. 
uh, using IPF using IPFS. So it's basically a combination of Bitcoin and, and IPFS. But then you also have deep methods which don't use blockchains or distributed ledgers at all, right? There's a very popular deep method uh, called deep web, which is used quite a lot. And uh, in in this case, the this identifier here, the method specific identifier, is just a domain name, and the did basically exists on a on a web server, right? So uh, this is this is also possible. Uh, you can then have a lot of arguments whether this type of identifier is really decentralized and whether it is persistent and and all of that. But uh, but it is also a valid deed because it has the same the same syntax and it follows the same the same specification. Um, or you have something like deed key, right? So deed key is also interesting because here uh, this is a deed that's not actually created, that's not actually written or stored in any kind of uh, external system like a like a blockchain. But in, in this case the the did itself is a is a public key, and and uh, you you create this did by creating a, a key pair, and you can also resolve the did by just looking at the did itself. So this is also a very also very popular did method that's that's used a lot if if you just want the the did itself to be to be a public key. Um, So yeah, this this shows the diversity of of these did methods. But what's always in common, of course, what's always the same is the there's a common syntax, and then there's a common uh, way how these dits can be can be used. Can can we ask questions? Yeah, please go ahead. So the did key, um, I I understand that, but um, it's challenging to me that you know it doesn't tell me how the did was constructed like which keep private key and, and resolution method am I supposed to assume between behind that one I mean from a, if it's an ethereum type of pri private key then I know how ethereum computes the private the public key but I don't know how this one's being computed so uh, here this uh, first of all, all of this can be is, is described for each did method in a did method specification. I, I forgot to mention that, but each one of these did methods has a separate document that uh, that specifies how it works. In the case of the did key method, uh, this is this string actually is not is not just a public key, but it's a public key which is encoded using. Uh, these 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 uh, multi codec and and multi base formats. If you look up multi base and multi codec, that's how this this string here is is encoded. And uh, the first character here, the Z, this is a character from from the multi base specification, which tells us uh, which tells us that the rest of the string is base fifty eight encoded. Uh, so that that first character says that the rest of the string is base fifty eight encoded, and then and then I I don't know the details right now, but the first few bytes here then okay. are are is, is a prefix from the multi codec uh, specification. There's a table basically, and so based on these first few bytes, you can you you will know if it's an RSA key or ED two five five or nine key or uh, elliptic curve key, and then. And Perfect. Then should, yeah. Then you should, should be able that, to understand the rest. That that answers my question. Thank you. That there is a specification somewhere that I can look up. Yeah. Yeah. For each one of them, there's a, there's a specification. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for posting the link. Uh. Okay. Yeah. Here I just have one slide that it's compared to other types of identifiers. So there are many other types of identifiers just exploring a little bit the, the characteristics of of deeds uh, here on the top right is is this uh diagram Zuko's triangle is, is relatively well known that that says when you, you know, when you look at different types of identifiers then 
it's very hard. It, it doesn't say it's impossible, but it says it's very hard for a certain type of identifier to fulfill all of these three properties, right? To be human meaningful, to be secure, and to be decentralized. And, and deeds, uh, generally speaking, deeds are designed to be here on this bottom line, right? So deeds are decentralized, meaning there's no not a single central authority that can control the deed namespace. And secure means that if you create a deed and you control it, then nobody else can create and, and control the same deed. But deeds are not uh, human meaningful in, in general, um, unless you, you look at the deed web method, for example, but that in turn would not be considered then decentralized. And, and looking at this, uh, as, as far as I'm aware, I, I think deeds are the only type of identifier that I'm aware of uh, which are decentralized and persistent and and resolvable and all of that at the same time. Um, uh, the one one property here that DITs don't have is delegatable, right? So DITs, there's no such thing as a as a hierarchy of DITs or sub DITs or something like that, right? The, the domain names you can delegate if you control a domain name. And you can create subdomains and subdomains under under that. Uh, so deeds don't really have have the concept of a of a parent deed and child deed or or anything like that. But other than that, they they have some they they combine some really interesting properties. And uh, here, just to say that deeds are valid URIs. So in a lot of places where URIs can be used, deeds can also be deeds can also be used. Okay, then some uh, motivation, just uh, probably you know this already, but just uh, give some inspiration where, what deeds are used for, why they are important. Deed by, a deed by itself is is not very useful, right? And nobody, so for, for end users, nobody wakes up in the morning and says, I want to create five, five deeds today because I, I need a few deeds, right? So this is something that's very uh, low level and ha happens behind the scenes, but a lot of other technologies uh, can use deeds and, and build on top of deeds. Uh, for example, in a verifiable credential, uh, usually the a deed can be used to identify an issuer, like a university or a government that issues a verifiable credential. And uh, deeds are also often used to identify uh, the subject of a credential. And then when you, when you use the verifiable credential, when you actually try to verify the proof on it, then you need uh, the deed and you need to resolve the deed. And I, I will talk about that a bit more, but this, this basic idea that deeds can be resolved and deeds have a built-in mechanism of control it's also useful just for authentication, uh, like an open ID connect uh, type of flow. You can use a deed to prove control of the deed, right? So you could theoretically just uh, use a deed uh, also as a, as a replacement for username and password. You can you can just log in to a website with a, with a deed because you can prove that you control a certain deed using the, the keys associated with it. Uh, um, assuming some protocol like OpenID Connect, uh, that that works, that that would be uh, able to work with deeds. And uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Just the, the third one here. So deeds can also be used for discovery, right? If I give you my deed, then you can look up information about the deed, including service endpoints. So you could look up a DITCOM service endpoint or endpoint of a decentralized web node, uh, which is a very interesting piece of technology, uh, or you can use a DIT also for discovering an, an XMPP endpoint for, for sending chat messages or, or other protocols. The DIT uh, core specification, what's the DIT roadmap? So yes, DIT has DIT, uh, DIT core, the DIT standard has been published over a year ago and there is now uh, an ongoing process in w3c in the world wide web consortium to 
launch a new date working group. Uh, so there's a process now to create a charter, uh, the, the rules, the, the scope of a new working group. And, and that new working group, uh, it's not yet, so there's some discussion what, what the new working group should do. It, it looks like, or the most likely scenario will be that the new deed working group will will maintain and uh, fix some uh, some problems or some mistakes in the current deed specification. And in addition to that, uh, produce a new specification about deed resolution. Uh, that's actually my, my next slide anyway, so I'll switch just to that one. Deed resolution is, is now what you actually do with the deed. Uh, so to look up uh, metadata about the subject that's identified by the deed. And uh, that's done in the form of, of, a, of the so-called deed document, right? So the document is a format that describes technical metadata about the subject. And the process of looking up the deed document, given the deed, that's called deed resolution. And deed resolution in the current W3C standard is only defined in an abstract way, uh, using an abstract interface, but there's not a lot of information in the current standard on how exactly deed resolution works and what kinds of uh, inputs and outputs and parameters exist exist in, in deed resolution. So there's a second there's a second specification. Uh, let me also put that here. There's a second specification about deed resolution, which is uh, not a standard, that's a draft specification, but the idea is that a new deed working group at the World Wide Web Consortium will then standardize this uh, to basically add more details about uh, about resolving it. How do you imagine did auth and web auth then will coexist? That's a, a really good question. So did auth is 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 a high level umbrella umbrella term, right? So there's no such there's no such thing as a concrete did auth protocol or did auth specification that doesn't exist. There's a there's a paper from a few years ago that talks about the concept of did auth and how it could potentially be implemented using what kind of what kind of protocol. And uh, but did auth is, is just a generic term, right? It, it's just a concept of using deeds to to authenticate, and uh, that that can be done with with uh, open ID open ID. Uh, connect. There's also this this entire new stack of Open ID for for verifiable credentials. Uh, all of all of that work where where this can also be used. And regarding regarding web authentication, I'm not an I'm not an expert on that. I I know it has been discussed uh, a few times. Uh, my understanding is with with web authentication you. You authenticate with a public key, right? So the public key is sort of easier, easier identifier. Um, whereas with with deeds, uh, one one important aspect of deeds is also that what's here in this deed document, this can be updated, this can change, right? And the most important information, which is on in the deed document, is the the public key. That's associated with the with the deed. Uh, there can also be multiple public keys. Uh, so in, in this deed document, you have public keys and you have service endpoints. And uh, together, this is the in information that's useful for engaging in some kind of interaction with the with the deed subject. And both can be updated and they can be updated that the keys and the service endpoints, they can be updated without uh, the deed changing, right? So that's why we say deeds are persistent identifiers. I can give you my deed, we can establish a relationship, we can establish a connection using our deeds and we, we, can, up, we can rotate our keys 
and we can change our endpoints. We, this gives us data portability, right? I can move my DITCOM service. I can move my Mastodon activity pub service. I can move my XMPP service from one place to the other. And I don't have to change my identifier. I can keep my social graph uh, intact. I don't have to uh, update everybody's address book with, with my new identifier. That That's one of the great value propositions of of this, this this kind of persistence and i'm not quite sure how that would relate to web authn because my understanding is with with web authn the identifier is the public key so if you if you change the public key then in the case of deeds you would still have the same identifier so i think i, I can't give a a very good answer on the web authn question but uh but would be happy to discuss this further maybe in our in our working group how can i make sure my d document has the has the correct syntax uh there is uh yeah, there are, there are a few things. There's a, a test suite, a did test suite at the, at the W3C working group. Um, where basically implementations of, of deeds and deed methods can submit their their deeds and their deed documents and their test results. And then the test suite will will uh, check and, and evaluate the results and the, the, the document. And in addition to that, there's also a wonderful tool called DeedLint by uh, Christoph Fabianek from On Your Data. He's also very active in DIFF and frequently participates in our working group. And this is a nice tool where you can paste, uh, put a DIT document and it will, it will validate it. It will check all the all the rules. So, so for example, I could I could try to take the the, the document here from my slide and uh, put it. Well, no, let me let me not do that because I I think there's some mistakes. It would be uh, embarrassing maybe. But in in general, uh, you can use this tool for validating the documents. I've heard that the FC did format is based off the public key. That's true. And if you rotate your public key, does that mean you must change your deed? Let me go back to the yeah. So here's an example of an Epsi did from the so Epsi is this European blockchain. Uh, let me yeah, so go back here to the to the list of, of did examples. So, so the answer is is definitely no. If you if you rotate the, the public key with this did method, then you don't have to change the did. It it is true that uh, for a lot of these did methods, there is a pattern that 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 this did method specific identifier is somehow based on the public key. That's not a requirement for did methods, right? It's up to every did method independently to to define what the rest of the the did means it can be a public key or a hash of a public key or an address on a blockchain or in, anything like that uh, that's not that that's always different but it is true that for many did methods uh, the string is is often based on public keys uh, i i think i think you're right uh, ian that's that's the case for for epsi so this string at FC, the FCD method has has undergone a few iterations or already, so there have been different versions of that. I'm not sure if this one is still in line with the with the latest specifications. This this may be a bit outdated, but but it is based on a on a public key, and the same is also true, for example, here for did indie. Uh, in this case, this is also based on a public key. However, it is based uh, on the first public key. Right, so the way how these did methods work 
is that even though the date is based on the initial public key, you can then uh, still rotate the keys, update the keys in the T document, and the date does does not change, right? So the date will the date itself is is persistent. Uh, it does not change if you change the the keys. Okay, uh, question about did web s. So did web s uh, we could have a have an entire separate session about uh, about that. Uh, did... Marcus, maybe maybe want to read the question so people who see the recording might know what they asked. Okay, I'm I'm sorry. I thought it might be visible on the recording. Uh, well, okay, they might so yeah yeah so there's a there's a question about uh did web s what's the difference between that and the regular did method um so yeah, let's spend a, a minute on on that maybe if there's a if there's a question did web s is a is a relatively recent proposal for uh, for a did method, I, I have some slides here that were presented at the Internet Identity Workshop a few weeks ago. Uh, if you are familiar with the with the did web method, the uh, did web method has been around for a few years, and uh, as I said, it's it's quite popular. Uh, it's it's really simple because in in this case that the did is resolved by basically downloading the did document from a web server, right? So uh, we were just talking about did resolution. Did resolution means obtaining the did document for a given did. And uh, this can sometimes be very complicated and it can sometimes involve uh, talking to a blockchain and talking to IPFS and looking up all kinds of information to, to retrieve the did document. But in the case of did web, this is very simple, right? So if you have a did, did like this, then the did document is just a file on a web server and you basically download that file and then you're done with the did resolution and, and you have this file. This is very popular because it's very simple. Everybody knows how to run a web server and how to publish files on a web server. However, this did method, did web has also been criticized quite a lot because it it, it doesn't have a lot of the properties that were intended for DITs originally. And uh, maybe one of the most obvious problems with DIT web is that uh, anyone could just change, anyone who has access to the to the web server could just change the, the DIT document, right? Uh, anyone who, anyone who can attack the DNS system, anyone who can run a man in the middle attack on an, on an HTTP connection, uh, Anyone who can compromise the, the SSL certificate or anyone who is just an administrator on the web server can potentially manipulate and, and attack your, your D document, right? And uh, this has been the subject of, of concern for some communities for a while. And so there have been uh, attempts to try to make the this D web method more secure uh, while at the same time maintaining the, the convenience that comes with it. And so did web S uh, without going into all the details, but did web S would look like this and it works very much in the same way as did web. So there's still a did document on a web server that can just be downloaded. But in addition to that, there's a second file uh, which is based on carry, uh, which is the key event receipt infrastructure. It's a, it's a, a set of specifications and technologies for creating and managing uh, cryptographic keys in a, in a very secure way. And there's an entire community around that and also a lot of information about, about carry, but uh, so there's and I'm not an expert on that, and we don't have a, a time to 
really talk about that too much. But the essence of it is that by having both on a on a web server, the did document and this carry file, uh, which which contains what's called a carry event stream, that makes the did document verifiable, right? So this this contains uh, hashes and and signatures and and cryptographic information, which secures the did document. So that means when you now download the did document and this other file then you don't just blindly trust what's in the D document because a number of attackers could have manipulated that. But in addition, uh, you can, you have this end verifiability, right? So as a, as a client that can look at both these files, can know that this is actually the correct D document for the deed that you're, uh, that you're trying to, to resolve. Um, is that is that sufficient as a as an answer for now, or I'd be happy to yeah answer more more questions or talk about this more in in if uh, if Discord or or Slack? Also feel free to to email me. Uh, okay, well, follow up question: How can we ensure that the carry file is not altered? By a rogue party. Well, you're right. Yeah, of course. So if the if somebody could manipulate this the document file, then of course they could also manipulate this carry file. But there's one one more thing that makes this deal web S method more secure, which is that the last part of the identifier here, the last part of the did is what's called a carry AID. And uh, here in this example, it's just one, two, three, four, five. But this is this is this is actually also cryptographic information that's part of the identifier, and this is linked to the information that's here in the in this carry file. So so what's here in this carry file can be traced back always to this. AID to this string that's part of the identifier itself. And that means that if you you cannot you cannot possibly manipulate well you can manipulate this carry file, but a client will be able to verify whether or not this was uh, what's in here, what's here in this uh, carry event file can actually be traced back to whoever controls this identifier here, right? Because this identifier here uh, is linked to my pri private public key pair. And so is this file here, right? So if you, yeah, so you say, if we trust the URI, then we can cryptographically trust the, the carry file. That's a, that's a good way of putting it, right? This This here is, this here is a is a hash also. It's a it's a cryptographic hash. It's not it's not quite just a hash of a public key, but it's a hash of 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 the information that you need to then verify this carry file. And so with the with the identifier itself, you can verify the contents of this carry file, and with the contents of this file, you can verify the did document. And that's how this is uh, the result of the did resolution process. In this case, is and verifiable uh, using the information from the DIT itself. And, and that's how this is different from just DIT web, but it's also designed to be just as convenient as DIT web because you just have to download files. You don't have to run uh, blockchain nodes or anything like that. But uh, yeah, happy to talk about this more. Okay, here yeah, we're... Only uh, 15 or 20 minutes left, I think. I uh, wanted to talk about these tools, of course, also a little bit. So we talked about deeds and deed resolution. Uh, there, there are two open source projects at DIFF. Uh, they are both work items of the Identifier and Discovery Working Group. 
One is called the universal resolve and the other one is called the universal registrar. And uh, the, the idea is basically to, to provide a, a tool uh, that can be used for easily working with deeds on, on one hand for resolving deeds, but also for creating and updating and deactivating deeds. Uh, Marcus, can we get a copy of your Web3, uh, WebS uh, slide deck? Yeah, I will also share the, the link here. I hope it's publicly readable. If 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 not, then then please send another message here in the the chat. Right. So these two these two tools, Universal Resolver, Universal Register, uh, open source projects at Diff, they basically expose the uh, the standard DIT operation functions for resolving deeds, that's the universal resolver, but also for creating deeds and updating deeds. Uh, we talked about that and also deactivating deeds. We haven't talked about that yet, but deeds can also be deactivated. And, and uh, as, we, as we've discussed, the way how deeds work underneath is, is very different depending on the deed method, right? So it's not it's not like DNS where you have to implement just one protocol and then you can resolve all the domain names in the world. No, for for deeds you basically have to implement each deed method uh, separately if you want to support multiple uh, deed methods. And uh, Universal Resolver is basically an attempt uh, to support uh, as many deed methods as as possible. Let me. Take, take a look. So here you can you can try it out. Uh, this is at this address, this is an instance of the universal resolver hosted by Diff. But it's uh, an open source project, right? So you can host it yourself. Uh, the, the idea is not that the whole world should use this address here. And in, in fact, it's uh, it's definitely not a, a production service, right? There's a there's a warning sign here in the corner. This is intended for uh, experimentation or for some tests. But if you if you're building an actual production uh, system, then you should uh, you should consider self-hosting this project. Or there are also some there are also some alternative services and alternative resolvers, right? So well, I also don't want to. Don't want to give the impression that this is the only way how deeds can be resolved. Uh, no, no, there are definitely other other open source projects and uh, libraries and SDKs and and so on that can be used for for resolving deeds. But here, this one is an open source uh, community project by Diff uh, that supports a lot of different deed methods. So I can basically try this out, uh, for example, with a Epsid it and I resolve this and then the, the result is here is here that the document uh, with a public key. In this case there are, there are no service endpoints here. And uh, this works this this works the same way for other types of, of deeds as well, right? So if I try did indie or did checked or did ion, then uh, this will also return the the did document. And as I said earlier, this is not this is not really intended uh, as something for end users, right? But uh, something that's that's used then by other building blocks by other technical components. So this public key. That we see right here okay, it could be used, for example, to verify a signature on a verifiable credential, or it can be used for uh, authenticating as part of an open ID flow, or it can be used for uh, authenticating a, a DITCOM connection when two peers uh, connect using the DITCOM protocol. Then uh, this cryptographic information can be used for authenticating the 
appears or it can be used for uh, authenticating communication with a decentralized web node All right so these can be used uh, theoretically anywhere where you can where you can use public keys is the universal resolver registry itself in ipfs or some decentralized storage by universal resolver registry what do you mean do you mean this 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 list of of the methods so yeah so uh this list of of the methods that that are supported by the universal resolver this is something we just maintain in the in the github repository uh, so if you go here at the, at the bottom there's a link also that that takes you to the the github repository of the universal resolver and there's there's basically a list a list of the supported did methods and for each did method there's a so-called uh, driver that that's what we call it so a, a driver there's a driver that that implements the that supports the did epsi method there's a driver that supports the did checked method did web did indie did ion and, and so on for each one of those there's a driver and uh, most of them are almost all of them are just uh, community contributions right so it's not uh, it's not one company or it's not uh, some diff uh, diff staff or diff developers who uh, who implement this this whole thing but basically each one of these drivers is like a plugin that supports a new did method and uh, through a pull request uh, a new driver and a new and support for a new did method can be can be added and, and this list of did methods that is supported by the universal resolver is just maintained here in the in the github repository so that's not in a, a decentralized file system or, or anything like that and and this this list can be can be, is, is maintained by a community contributions basically okay uh then since we don't have a lot of time left let me just mention also the second tool universal registrar uh, so to explain that a little bit there is another specification which is also a diff work item i will also put that into the chat called uh did registration, so that's a separate spec. And uh, this specification tries to define an abstraction layer and, and interfaces, not just not for resolving deeds, but also for creating and updating and deactivating deeds. Uh, so it, uh, looking here at the, at the slide, it defines these three operations if you want to create a new did if you want to update a did and if you want to deactivate a did defines these uh, abstract functions with certain inputs and certain outputs and the and the universal registrar is again an open source project at diff uh, which implements this for several several different did methods and uh if if you think about this this is this is not so not so straightforward to do because the methods work in in very different ways as as we've said uh, in the case of did web uh, for did web for example if you want to create a did you have to upload a file to a web server for uh, did epsi if you want to create a did you have to write a transaction to a blockchain uh, same for did indie or for did checked you have to write transactions to distributed ledgers but using all kinds of different technologies uh, for creating a did key uh, you just need to create a, a key pair basically and do nothing else and so on so these create 
update and deactivate operations, it's quite a bit more complex to, to build an abstraction layer that works across different deep methods. But nevertheless, this, uh, this specification tries to do that. So it, it, it defines an interaction between a client and the regist registrar component, and which then abstracts away all the details again of, of all the different deep methods and, and provides a universal API, universal interface for, for uh, creating and updating and deactivating leads. Uh, this is this is what it what it looks like. So again, this is an uh, here a diff diff open source project and instance that people can use. Uh, I, I have to say it's not as advanced or as mature maybe as the universal resolver. This universal registrar is a bit more experimental. Uh, but but it mo it mostly works I, I I would say so it it can be used for creating the ion the key the web the solve the checked and so on and and all of these did methods are supported using a a generic interface which is defined here in this the registration specification. Um, just a few minutes left, I, I think. Are there, are there any questions or otherwise I would talk about uh, just this a bit more. Uh, yeah, Andrew. Yeah, yeah, hello. So yeah, thank you for the presentation. I have maybe a question, uh, not maybe specific for current presentation, but maybe just for um, hearing your opinion uh, here. For example, we have uh, uh, an, an abstraction like uh, deactivation for DID. But what do you think uh, about uh, like, for example, uh, any, uh, any verifiable credential which was issued by such DID? What uh, should be done here like for example if uh, the id was deactivated what should we do with uh, already issued uh, verifiable credentials that's a that's a really good good question i i don't think there's a definitive answer anywhere in the in, in either the deed or the verifiable credential standard my, my answer would be that it should not be uh, it should not be used anymore if a, if a deed is deactivated like for example if a very fiber credential is issued by by a university uh, like a diploma credential is issued by a university and the issuer deed is uh, so that the deed that identifies the university as the issue if that gets deactivated then uh, a deactivated deed when you resolve it, so when you try to resolve a deactivated DIT, then the resolver will not return a DIT document. It, it will return only a piece of metadata, which says mm -hmm. that the DIT has been deactivated and, and you don't get back the DIT document. And since you don't get back the DIT document, you also don't have the public key and you cannot verify the the verifiable mm -hmm. credential anymore. So my answer would be it should, it should, not, it should not be accepted uh, verifiable credential that was issued by a deactivated deed. However, there has been there has been some discussion in the in the community. Oh and and by the way, for some deed methods, uh after a deed is deactivated, it's it's also then technically uh Im impossible to to retrieve the, the deed document, right? So in some cases when you deactivate a deed then the deed document is actually deleted and, and you can never get it back. That's a bit did method specific where there are differences between the did methods. There have been some discussions in the community that you could uh, send a, a parameter to the resolver, which will override this default behavior of not returning the did document. So you could, you could send mm -hmm. them an, an option to the resolver and you can say, please, even though the did is deactivated, please still return the did document because I still want to try and, and verify something even though i'm aware that the 
speed is is deactivated. Uh, so that that's also that's also possible, right? And maybe you you have some good reason why you still want to accept a, a credential. Mm -hmm. But uh, but but my answer would be that the that the default behavior is for the activated date to not not return that the document and and that it should not be mm. used. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, very good question, uh, Ian. Which did methods have the highest adoption uh, and usage? So. Of course, uh, did methods have different advantages and disadvantages, right? We we said that did web method, for example, is very easy to use, but it has some security disadvantages. Maybe uh, if you look at did methods based on Bitcoin, then maybe they are very secure, but uh, they cost a lot of uh, Bitcoin cryptocurrency, right? If you look at uh, did EPSI, for example, you could you could maybe trust it because it's run by a number of national governments or maybe you don't trust it because it's run by governments and not as decentralized as you want some did methods require certain onboarding procedures some did methods are very fast and performant like did ion is is known to be very scalable if you want to create lots and lots of dates then did ion is a good choice uh, some did methods have very interesting extra features uh, like did checked uh, did checked supports some some features like linked resources uh, special parameters versioning that's that's very interesting so all of these have advantages and disadvantages it's a bit hard for me to say which one have the most adoption and usage uh, if i may i'm not sure uh, I'm not sure, Lamari, how appropriate it is to to uh, also mention commercial products, but my, my company, Danube Tech, we also have a a SaaS platform called GoDD.com, uh, which I will quickly mention here, which is basically just a, a commercial version of these same these same open source tools. So this is a more a little bit more advanced, more professional commercial version of Universal Resolve and Registrar. This has a page called called stats.godd.com, and uh, I, I think we're we're out of time. But if you're interested, you could look through that a little bit, and and you can see some uh, some statistics also of of uh, did popularity popularity of certain did methods over time, right? So you can see some charts here uh how many deeds in what kind of deed methods and what kind of networks uh, have existed over over time so that could answer some of the questions about about adoption but uh yeah i think we're we're out of time uh thanks so much and uh feel free to contact me via email or of course diff uh, slack or discord and uh good luck with the with the hackathon uh have have a lot of fun, everybody. Hope to hear from you again. Awesome. Thank you, Marcus. And I did drop the link to the Discord server in the chat. So if you have further questions for Marcus, there is a channel in there for this session. So you can follow up with that. And of course, don't forget to register for the hackathon. So I did put that link in there as well. We do have over 200 participants so far signed up. So we are going to have some really fun competition going. Um, so with that, I'm going to thank Marcus one more time for joining us today and being flexible on this, this very interesting week uh, between US and European time zones. Um, and I'll encourage you all to join us tomorrow at 9 a.m. that specific time. Remember, if you're in Europe, it's an hour earlier this week. Um, but we're going to be having an introduction to Veramo. And also there will be uh, a session right after that on Trinsic and the BBS signature scheme. So look forward to seeing all of you tomorrow. Check out those events in Discord and I'll see you around the community. Thank you again. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.